we're going to talk about introduction to distributed workload with Ray on Kubernetes. Uh, before we get started, quick show of hands, how many of you know what Ray is or have heard of it? A lot of you, good. Uh, if you haven't, this is perfect talk. We're going to talk about what Ray is. How many of you, and this is going to be a dumb question, how many of you have heard of Kubernetes? I want to see all the hands. You have been here for like three days now. Come on. Uh, good. Uh, all of you have done that. The last one, how many of you uh, care about distributed workloads? Good. So this is a good, good mix. We have, uh, so this, you're on the right talk, ho hopefully. Um, so my name is Mofi. Uh, I am a developer advocate at Google, and I have here with me Abdel, I'm also a developer advocate at Google. My voice is a little bit choppy, so hopefully you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. It's not COVID, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, also, you know, uh, if you need to, need to find us later, we're, we have all moved to Blue Sky this recently, so you can uh, go there. Uh, we're, we're leaving the Bard app for a different flying-themed app, so uh, you, can, you can come and find us there. So let's get us started, right? So distributed computing. Uh, the main concept of distributed computing is why use one computer do, to do a thing when you can use a 1,000? Right? So like instead of using one, we're going to use 1,000. That's the whole goal of distributed computing. A couple of things you need to kind of know about distributed computing. And these days, most of the distributed computing use cases are being used for AI computing, where Python, the language, is basically the default language in that space. So that's uh, point one. Point two, with uh, generative AI and like this new emergence of large language models and these large AI workloads, uh, distributed computing is no longer a luxury, an optional thing. You kind of have to do it to be able to build these big models. So with these two knowledge in mind, let's talk about distributed computing in a little bit more details. So why is distributed computing? Why I have a big computer, I have a pretty expensive laptop in front of me, I could just do it in my machine. But the challenge is, um, Compute can only go far. Moore's law kind of like locks us to a certain limit of how big of a computer we can make. Every year we can make it a little bit bigger, but that limit only gets, can be pushed so far. So the only way you can get bigger is by using many of the small computers. So you can c combine a bunch of these computers together and somehow get them to work together to get compute that is impossible on a single machine. Availability is the next one, so that those big machines like NVIDIA GPUs or TPUs are hard to come by. So if you can solve your problem by breaking it down into small chunks that you can solve using commodity hardware like a regular CPU or cloud or your data centers, now you can solve a lot more problems that you could otherwise just wait for some company to build the next bigger machine. Next is efficiency. So again, if you can break the problem in small chunks, you can do these embarrassingly parallel sol solutions to problems and gain a lot of efficiency because those commodity hardware is a lot cheaper to rent from cloud or buy at, like at, at a bulk rather than trying to build a supercomputer. Those are more expensive. And finally, flexibility. So when you can break your problem into small parts, now you have a lot more flexibility in when and where you run it. You get a lot of bargaining power with both your cloud provider or like building your own data centers. Now you have a lot of flexibility how and when you solve these problems. But that's kind of like why we do distributed computing. It comes with some challenges now. Like, if I wrote something and that ran on my machine, it is actually like code runs and it finishes, I'm done. But when you try to break the same problem into like a million pieces, one of those pieces fall and all of a sudden I don't know how to now like reconcile my solution back to the original parts. So consistency is a big problem. And this consistency is not just for like the code itself, it's also for the data because I have data across now thousands of machines. I have networking challenges to communicate back and forth between them. And if something fails, how do I go back to like running state? There are problems where failure basically means you have to start over. There are techniques like checkpointing where you can restart back. So there is a lot of more problems now you have to solve to now pro solve this problem in a distributed manner. Next is concurrency. So when you break your problem down into like a bunch of pieces, all those problems are solving it like uh, individually. How do you go back? Where do you sync? You have like this uh, synchronization problem where you can need to uh, solve the problem and bring the solutions back together in the same place. And a couple of the last ones are like security. Now you have like your attack surface is a lot bigger. Now you have thousands of machines and you have to take care of controlling the security for all of them at the same time. And with that comes the problem of complexity of management. So Kubernetes does help with some of these things as we're gonna talk about, but it is over the last 10 years, a lot of folks have tried a lot of different things, found a lot of different challenges in that space. And I think any talk about distributed uh, compute cannot be completed without talking about cap theorem. It basically, basically says you cannot have it all. Uh, you can either have two of the three that are available. So either you can be consistent, or you can have full availability, or you can be fault tolerant. So every single solution we build around the distributed compute frameworks kind of try to get as much as all th three things as possible, but usually they kind of have to make a concession on one or the other. Um, so with all that, 
That was a very rapid fire introduction of distributed compute. Let's talk about Ray. Uh, so Ray is an open source Python library that helps you with some of the distributed compute <coughs> challenges. And what Ray is, it's a Python, open source Python library that does give you a lot of this library and frameworks to build distributed compute platforms. It's a simple and flexible API. Their claim also, I can verify, I have tested it, it's pretty simple. Scalable, because Ray gives you fundamental building blocks and it scales without you having to do additional work. You just say, I wanted one copy, now I want 10, now I want 1,000. You can just scale within the same linear approach. And finally, Ray have built the library for working with CPU, which is the most common, also GPUs and TPUs, which is now the compute of the new generation of AML workload. If you look at the Ray components, there are basically three layers. At the bottommost layer is your hardware, your compute. We work for a cloud provider, so we're at the bottom layer where all the things run. Right above that is the Ray core. And today's talk will mostly cover the bottommost two layer, Ray core and cloud. On top of that, Ray also provides a bunch of other libraries that help you do machine learning-esque tasks, like data processing, training, tuning, uh, reinforcement learning, and serving. But those are all libraries that you can choose other solutions for. Ray actually is a Python library that works with most of the other things that exist in the ecosystem. So if you look at the Ray AI libraries like Ray Data, uh, there are a bunch of competition in that space, things like Data Lake, Arrow, Parquet, uh, Snowflake, they all do similar things, things like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas. You could also pick and choose any of those to work with Ray. For training, you have things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Hugging Face libraries that exist in this space. For tuning, you can look at things like Nevergrad, MLflow, uh, bits, and, uh, bits and biases. So you have choice about pretty much in all different categories you are using Ray for. For serving, obviously, Gradio, uh, Streamlit, VLLM, TGI, Fast API. You could basically pick and choose anything you like or whatever your ecosystem uh, demands, and you can run them on top of the Ray core. Now, when you want to understand Ray, there are three key concepts you need to understand to be able to use Ray core properly. Number one is task. Uh, task is any Python function that is going to be executing as a remote function in the Ray cluster. Uh, next up is actors. Actors are something that has state. And the final one is object. Object is the reference to either the task or the actor. So instead of me telling you, I'd rather show you what it means. So if you can see my code, uh, is the text big enough? Should I make it bigger? Bigger. Bigger, bump it up. All right, big enough? Could mostly see it. Uh, okay, so let's write some uh, Python code to do this. So first things first, I'm gonna write a Python function. So def sum func, and this is going to return one. So this function, all, if I were to run this function, all of us know it's gonna happen. Uh, some func. Anybody want to take a guess what's gonna happen? No takers? So far, one, yeah, that's, that's the function. But what if I want to now run this function as a distributed function as a Ray task? All I have to do is do uh, decorator ray.remote. Oh, spell it right, uh, ray.remote. Now this is a Ray remote function. Of course, to use the decorator, I need to import the dependency I have, so import Ray. And right now, I don't have a Ray cluster running, so Ray library also lets you create a cluster very quickly, so I can do something like Ray. In it, that's going to create a cluster locally on my machine. Now, I just called, created this Ray remote function, but I'm not using it yet. So to use it, I have to create an object reference to this function. So what I can do, create a new object called object and call sumfunc.remote. Now, that is going to go ahead and create a reference to this remote function that is going to execute against my Ray cluster. And to get the data out of my remote function, I have to do ray.get object instead of doing calling the function directly, now I'm calling ray.get on the object. Now, whatever the result of that object would be, I will get that printed out on my code here. So let's run this code again. For the most part, it should be very similar, and what did I do? Uh, okay, so I think, uh, live coding, people. Okay, save that, try that one more time. Oh, that's not it. That doesn't like it. All right, let me send it somewhere else, hold on. Uh, no, no, no. And I didn't want to go there just yet, but I might have to do it. Okay, let's try this one more time. All right, cool. Um, so for some reason, it could not start the Ray cluster on my local machine, but what I did here, I started, I have a Ray cluster running on my Kubernetes cluster, and I'm just sending my code to that Kubernetes cluster. 
live coding, what, what can you do? But the same idea still exists. If I did, if I, my, my computer could start a Ray cluster, it would have sent it to there. But in this case, I am sending it to this remote cluster that I'm port forwarding to that is running on Kubernetes. Now, that is the task. Next one is actor. So actor is similar to Ray task, but with state. So instead of just sending an arbitrary function as a Ray remote function, we create this class that is going to keep state. So every time something happens to this class, we can keep track of what have happened. So in this case, we create a class counter, which has a field called counter, which is set to zero. And every time increment gets called, we increment that number by one. So every time, so you could see that as anything else. Anything you need to have state, you want to use an actor. Anything is just a standalone function, you want to use a task. So in this case, we do that. Again, I'm going to use this one instead of the built-in one. And if I were to run Python actor.py, and I'm just sending it to the remote function, and you would see that I'm getting back one, two, three, four, five. I call it five times in a loop right here, range five. And every time I call it, the increment goes up by one, and I print it, I get one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the last thing, we're gonna, probably not going to run it because it's a bunch of code here, but the last thing is when you want to build it out, the main concept is every remote function execution actually happens immediately. I sent out my code, I send all the remote function call to the Ray cluster at the same time, and they execute, and we can then collect the result in the end. So you could start seeing if you're doing something like, Abdul is going to talk about like an example of it, when you're building it out, you could then fan out your workload onto these remote computers. As many computers you have, you can run them parallelly up to like hundreds of thousands execution at the same time, and then collect the result. Uh, instead of doing sequentially, which is going to be much slower, you're doing one calculation waiting, one calculation waiting, you could just do all the computation. And as, as long as you have compute resources, you could pretty much scale to infinity. And again, the bigger you scale, the more time you need to synchronize them. But in the... Um, Long run, obviously, if you can scale higher, you get a lot more faster compute because you're just doing a distributed fan, um, fashion. So let's move on to the next part. Yeah, and so what's, what, what we're noticing these days also is that people are using open source platforms or open source tools, Kubernetes as a platform, to build ML platforms. So we're going to do a little bit of a role play here today, uh, where I will be the platform admin, and Mofi is... The ML engineer or the data scientist. We, we, it's a very small company. I have to do two jobs at the same time, this economy, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, as a platform admin, my main area of focus is Kubernetes. It's all the infrastructure, um, all the accelerators, all the storage, all the networking, all that stuff, right? So basically, pretty much everything in blue in the slide is my, my problem. Yeah, as a data scientist and an ML engineer, I like, love my Python notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. I want to write my code, I want to write my fine tuning and serving code, as well as use all these open source libraries that exist in the space. Things like PyTorch, things like Airflow, MLflow. Whatever my team needs, I'm going to then use them. And I'm going to ask the platform team to give me the resources and the right tools so that I could run them without having to learn about all like Kubernetes and VMs and all that fun stuff myself. And so where Ray really shines very well in building ML platforms is that it creates that layer that ties the actual Kubernetes platform itself to things that data scientists care about. One of the things we talked about in the previous slide, well, didn't talk about, but it's in the blue in the middle that we didn't talk about, is Q. And we're going to quickly give you like a 10-second overview of Q. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please talk to us later, because Q is much bigger. So it's an open source project started by the uh, SIG batch. And what Q does, it creates a structure that lets you share resources in the same Kubernetes cluster in a fair manner. So you could have a job that gets abstracted by something called workload, and each workload runs against something called a local queue, which then runs on a cluster queue that is like a queue resource. And that cluster queue has access to a bunch of the Kubernetes resource that you have underneath. So you could create a system where a bunch of team can target the same cluster queue, and depending on priority and their quota, they could access the resources faster than other teams. And when nobody's using those resources, you could share those resources with other people. So you can create an ML platform with built-in multi-tenancy. So again, it's not a talk, Q, Q is not the topic of this talk, but if you want to learn more about Q, please talk to us later. And so similar to any application that you would, you would build, uh, a, a machine learning problem has a life cycle. And usually that life cycle starts with data processing. The machine learning with, without data is pretty much useless. So you start with data processing, then you will do your training or your fine tuning depending on what you're trying to achieve, and then you will have to do the inference, so it's the serving part, right? 
The beauty of open source and also the beauty of Q of Ray is that you can choose Ray for one part, the data processing in this case, but use other tools like PyTorch for the fine tuning and VLLM for the deployment. Or you can just choose to use Ray across the, the entire lifecycle of the machine learning process. So you, you have libraries for data processing, you have libraries for fine tuning, and then you have objects to do Ray serving, which we're going to look at, at an example later. Uh, just one thing. Uh, the First one that we showed, this is actual solutions that is available. If you scan the QR code on the top right, the entire code base is available on GitHub that you can go find and play around with yourself. Yeah. So how do you run Ray? Yeah. Uh, so Ray is, uh, again, a Python library that you can run on your local machine. But again, if you want to distribute computing, I only have like one laptop. So I can do distributed on a single laptop. That's kind of tough. So when you're talking about Ray library, the part that we care about is the Ray core. Ray core is the part that is doing the, all the distributed, cool distributed stuff. All the Ray AI libraries, they are actually standalone libraries that you could use with or without Ray even if you want to. But the Ray core needs some compute to run. And that compute uh, could be VMs. A lot of us have still have VMs and data centers. But it also could be, and in our case, it is containers. So when you want to run Ray in the containers, the best way to do that is using Kubray. Kubray is an open source project maintained by the Ray team and the community to make sure that Ray things can be run on Kubernetes in an easy, manageable way. And so before we move on, uh, we, do, we, we, we don't really have a slide here, but basically Ray follows kind of like the same architecture as Kubernetes. It has a control plane and a data plane. The control plane is the API endpoint. That's where you send your jobs to be executed. And the worker plane is the, where the actual distributed computing will happen. Basically, whether you are running on VMs or running on containers on Kubernetes, it's the same exact architecture. The only difference is that on VMs, the control plane will be a VM. On Kubernetes, the control plane will be a pod, right? So what uh, Mofi showed earlier, when you do the array init 127 localhost, like, believe us, that's actually a remote cluster. It's not a local I'll cluster. Show, I'll show that in a second. It's, it's a yeah, it's a remote cluster through uh, port forward. So why Kubernetes? Why would you even bother with Ray on Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is pretty good at doing automation, uh, infrastructure automation, right? Scaling up your clusters, scaling them down, uh, creating new resources, giving you a ready-to-use node in, like, split second. Great. Great at scaling. Great at high availability. If your job is running and it gets disrupted because whatever reason, then you can just, Kubernetes will just uh, retry it. If the head node or the control plane of Ray dies, it will just be recreated, right? Um, um, advanced device management, there is actually, within the Kubernetes community, there is a working group called Working Group Device Management, which is looking into the problem of how can you actually get metrics, how do you uh, optimize the utilization of hardware accelerators, so GPUs and TPUs in Kubernetes itself. Yeah. And then Kubernetes is multi-cloud. You can run it on-prem, you can run it on Google, AWS, Azure, Oracle, whatever. Um, so pretty much Ray on Kubernetes is as portable as any application running on Kubernetes. The only probably the 5 or 10% differences between cloud providers would be the type of accelerators you're, you're going to have. So Kubray, as, a, as, a, as a, a Mofi mentioned, is an operator that allows you to basically spin up a Ray cluster on top of Kubernetes and then use Ray core to just like send your jobs to um, that cluster running on top of Kubernetes. Um, then Kubray itself has three APIs. You can think about them as CRDs. There is a Ray cluster object, which allows you to spin up a cluster. So pretty much how many nodes do you want for your worker nodes? What's the configuration of those nodes? How many GPUs do you want to be attached to them, et cetera, et cetera? There is a Ray job, which allows you to create a job. Um, so it will leverage the job API in Kubernetes under the hood, but it has like a much higher level of um, um, abstraction. And then there is a Ray service, which we're going to look at the demo later, which is actually serving the model. So once you have uh, trained, fine-tuned your model, you need to serve it. You have the Ray service, which is a very, uh, very nice object. It's a single YAML object that contains your service, like your like, like, like the container um, running the inference server, the model, and also it will generate the Kubernetes service, capital S, under the hood once the model is ready to be um, serving. Yeah, so let's take a look and see what all of them look like in practice. So the first thing, we already actually kind of seen that already, which was the Ray cluster that we send our job to instead of running locally. So I have a cluster already set. I don't want to spin up everything live. We have a limited amount of time. So if I want to keep control, get, actually, before I do that, API resources. I'm going to see if, I, if this cluster has Ray installed or not. So if I were to do API resources and grep on the word Ray, I would see that I have three different new CRDs available to this Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this is Ray cluster. 
Ray Jobs, and Ray Services. So as Abdul mentioned, these are the three CRDs that gets installed when you install Kubray on your cluster. And uh, in this case, we're using a GK cluster. Again, Kubray works across any Kubernetes distribution that you have. Next up, uh, I have a, a Ray cluster uh, that I have set up. I actually have multiple here. We're going to talk about what each of them are doing. But the one we were sending the job to was the Ray cluster demo, right? So if I were to do kube control uh, get service, this morning all of you saw the, the, the family feud. The actual canonical way to pronounce kube control is kube control. So all, everybody else was wrong. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, die on this hill. Uh, but no, as of Kubernetes 1.5, Five, I think they actually is in the release note. So if you want to go back and look it up, is the canonical way to pronounce it. So, so it's not kubectl. No, nope, it's kube control. So yes, uh, ninety percent of the people were wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, the cluster we are talking about is the kube cluster demo head service. That's the cluster IP, and I set up a port forwarding to that particular one, this one in the client port. So I can send my job there. I could do one more port forward, and this has multiple ports in this particular service. I can k port forward, uh, and if I can spell properly, service, uh, ray, cluster, demo, head service, that's the one. I'm going to port forward the 8265. 8265 is the default port ray cluster uses for their dashboard. So if I were to go that, I can go one more. And you can see I have this dashboard. If I refresh, you would see. And I've been sending a lot of these jobs here. You could see all, all my jobs that I have sent so far onto this cluster. They're all sent here. Some of them failed, some succeeded. But Ray Cluster also gives you this nice view of like all the jobs, all the services, all the uh, actors and things that are running in there. So actors, as I said, actors have state. So if I created some actors that I had created in the past, it would remember what the state of that actor was. And metrics and logs and all that fun stuff. So that's your Ray Cluster. Now let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Uh, make this smaller. Make this bigger. Uh, so let's look at, so this is my definition of a Ray cluster, which is created the Kubernetes job of uh, a Kubernetes object of Ray cluster. I, as Abdul mentioned, you define your head group and your worker group. And they're separate. Head is the one that controls and distributes all the work. Con worker is the one that runs your workload. You set up exactly how much resource you want to give to each of those. You can also set up auto-scaling with HPA and VPA to make them bigger. Uh, and you set up the worker group. And then I define a Ray job where I basically want to just know how much resource this particular Ray cluster have. Very simple Python code, but it could run pretty much anything you want. And in that one, I'm targeting my Ray cluster, the one that I are, is already created. So this is a static Ray cluster that exists on my Kubernetes cluster. I'm sending job to it. So I'm going to kill this one, and let's try, I'm going to delete first, because I ran this before. But let's apply that again. kubectl apply dash f cube Ray. Cube control. You know what? Stop it. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to better myself, people. Uh, so thank you for keeping me honest. Anyway, I created this Ray job uh, examples. If I do keep control, get pods, I would see that a new job has started. Now it's running. This is the new one that I just created. And in a few seconds, this is going to run against my uh, Ray cluster, and it's going to respond back with some logs. So I could do keep control, logs, Ray job. I have too many things here. Sample, G, J, something, something. If I were to do this, you would see that it completed and it printed out a bunch of things. Again, I'm talking to a Ray cluster using a Kubernetes object like a Ray job. So Ray job is interesting, but this time I was targeting an existing Ray cluster. But the method that is actually suggested for Kubernetes users is not to keep a Ray cluster running for a long time. This is the mode that is called ephemeral Ray cluster. The reason you want to do that is Abdul is going to talk about in a second. But the way to do it is in your Ray job definition, you have another spec, which is just called Ray cluster spec. So you define a Ray cluster as part of your Ray job, and it spins up both the Ray cluster and the Ray job at the same time. And your workload will run in that said Ray cluster. And once it's done, everything will be teared down. Right? So why it's important, Abdul will talk about it in a second. But that's the way people actually recommend you do uh, your Ray jobs on Kubernetes. And the final example, and this is probably the most interesting example of the bunch, is using Ray service. Now, all this time, the examples I've been sending, it's been one line of Python code. So all of you are thinking, OK, if I have a big Python project, how do I get that code into my Ray cluster? This is how you do it, right? So I'm defining a Ray service. And inside, there is a service config v2. Inside that service config v2, the interesting part is this working dir, which is pointing to a GitHub repository. In this case, uh, the Ray project GitHub repository, the .zip file of the GitHub archive. 
If you have this code available in something like a GCS bucket or an S3 bucket, you could also point it to that. This code also could be in a private repository. You just need to have your Git uh, access token to be able to access this. In this case, this is public, so I don't need anything else. Once you put this working directory at the runtime, this code will be uh, uh, unzipped and put in the root of the repository of the uh, Ray cluster worker. And then you could find wherever your code is using the fully qualified path of that code. So in that example, the code lives in slash ray operator, slash config, slash sample, slash VLLM, slash serve, and the name of the deployment is model. So that's how you basically find the import path of the model you're trying to serve. So again, we are serving a Llama 3 8 billion parameter model in GKE using GPUs in this example. So you can see if I go down to my worker spec, you will see I'm defining that my worker needs to have GPU access. Right? So my head node, which is just distributing the work, does not need GPU because it's just finding work, finding worker, just sending it out. But the worker that is going to do the actual work needs to have access to GPU. Again, we can set up auto-scaling limits and other things here to scale up, up, up and down our workload. But let's look at k get service. And I should see a service called llama 38 b service serve service. Once this is running, I can now have a, I have a Llama 3 that is running there that I can go access. To access it, it's running on port 8000. So I could do k okay, port forward service Llama 3 and expose port 8000. And then there is a, uh, like a curl command that I can send to get this data. And I just copied it here because I don't want to type that. I don't trust myself to type that long a command. So I'm going to send this. And I just passed the output to JQ. And the question I had asked is, uh, you are a helpful assistant. Uh, provide a brief uh, sentence descript describing the Ray open source project. Let's see Llama knows Ray or not. The answer I got, the Ray project is an open source, high performance distributed computing framework developed by Databricks. That's wrong. Uh, <laughs> that supports Python and allows for scalable computing and data processing. They got about 90% right, but I don't know in 2024, LLMs getting 90% right is good enough. But the idea is the models do things. Like uh, there is a serving happening. Uh, Databricks didn't do Ray, it's any scale that worked on Ray. So, uh, yeah. Let, let's set the record straight. Yes. <laughs> um, so that is kind of like we're serving now. Like we saw the Ray cluster, Ray job, and Ray service, all those different uh, fundamental building blocks of Ray. So let's get back to the next part. And so um, um, Mofi spoke quickly about this idea of using ephemeral versus uh, static clusters. So ephemeral clusters are actually pretty good for reproducibility. If you are creating a new cluster for every job, you are ensuring that the cluster will be fresh, and, and if you have a problem, you can reproduce it. It's great for, um, you don't need to do any maintenance because the cluster will be created and then it will be deleted right after. And um, you get better observability because you're not running multiple jobs on the same cluster. So since, since you're running only one job, you can actually look at what that the jobs particularly is doing. Some of the cons is, of course, it takes time for that cluster to be created. So your startup latency could be big. The Ray dashboard doesn't have any uh, persistent storage. So all the logs and metrics can be lost. So you have to figure out how to ship them outside uh, Kubernetes to store them somewhere if you want to look at them later. Um, that, yeah. Now, for the static side, if you keep persistent Ray clusters, that's actually great because the startup time for a workload could be very fast. Um, you potentially do not need to repackage your code with all its dependencies. If the cluster already exists and has much, much of the dependencies, you don't need to send them each time you're sending a job. You only send to, to need to send the very particular dependencies if you make code changes, import new libraries. And the Ray dashboard can be actually used to track history, so you can see how your job has been performing as you're making modifications to it. Some of the cons um, is, yeah, new dependencies can be tricky, so you have to figure out what do you have already in the cluster and what you don't have. And if the cluster is brought down for maintenance, the behavior could be un unpredictable. So, um, so that's the side of ephemeral versus static. Now, there are a couple of security considerations you need to keep in mind when you're using Ray. First, first and most important one is that the Ray API endpoints does not have authentication or authorization. So in that case, you will have to look into whatever your load balancer, uh, your uh, cloud provider provides in terms of load balancers, proxies to be able to implement that. The second thing is this running Ray on Kubernetes is multiple layers. And le multiple layers means complexity, which means troubleshooting can be harder, and your attack surface could be big. So this is something also that you have to keep in mind. But Ray itself, or Cube Ray, is growing. Uh, the project has uh, quite a lot of uh, contributors, 140 contributors, 100 organizations. Um, there are like more than 50 blog posts. And at scale, there are about 10,000 Ray clusters running uh, with about 40,000 pods. 
We're going to briefly talk about two main things that are, th these are exciting stuff coming to Kubernetes uh, that are going to make Ray even better. Um, uh, optimize, so DRA uh, stands for Dynamic Resource Allocation, and it's a feature that is uh, meant to um, solve the problem of um, getting GPUs and TPUs, right? Uh, the joke we always make is that if you walk into a VC and you tell them to have GPUs, that's the only word you have to say and they will give you money. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other one is in-place VPA, basically being able to resize uh, pods without restarting them. This would be great for um, uh, Ray because if you, re you wrong size your pods to start with and then you realize later that you need more resources, you can just like resize the pods, add more CPU and memory to it. Um, so it's an in-place in upgrade basically. Yeah, the other thing to add about the VPA is when you have like regular workload, you kind of know what that workload size is. But when you are doing a, like a distributed workload send to the worker, that because like you have like, let's say you started with 10, but all of a sudden you need to scale to 50, that is not a predefined workload that can come after. So if you can resize the worker at runtime, that means you don't have to restart the worker. You could just like fit more in the same node and fit more work in the same node. Yeah. And the final thing we're going to say, again, uh, again, we work for Google, so this is the only, I think, Google slide we're going to talk about. We recently announced Ray Operator on GK. That means installing Ray on GK is just like one click, either via your ISC of choice, one line of code in your Terraform or Pulumi, or if you're using the console, it's just like one checkbox, and we just install and maintain the lifecycle of Ray on your behalf for you. So if you're using Ray and if you're using GK, just uh, give it a try. I think uh, it's going to make your lifecycle and life using Ray a lot easier. And with that, thank you very much for coming to the talk. I hope it was useful. We would be very happy if you could provide us with some feedback. This is the first time we did this talk together and actually the first time we talked together on stage. So uh, yeah, just scan QR code, give us some feedback, and thank you very much. Yeah. And <laughs> we have about three, four minutes-ish before they kick us out. There but is a microphone, microphone over there. Microphone is over there. If you have any questions, please do ask. But we are holding you off from lunch. I will, I will not feel bad if you leave for lunch. I'll be OK. OK. Thanks, guys. Really helpful. So one question, non-tech side. So the Ray, no, using Ray real time. So a lot of data scientists who are out of college, who are not used to that learning curve. How do you see the Ray, you know, using, adapting Ray in a, who are used to the Jupyter Notebook? Uh -huh. It's not, it's not pure coding, pure bash, pure yeah. command line. So do you see any, any So the, the, that's a great question. I think a lot of the, the, the there's a pushback of, I'm, I'm, I'm so in love with my notebooks, I never can leave. Um, so I think Ray, actually, a lot of the use cases of Ray, you can just run them through notebooks. So you can actually never have to leave your notebook uh, because it's a Python environment. As long as it's a Python environment, it's going to just work. So it, I think long term is going to make it easier to productionize your notebooks. Because if you write the code already in Ray, you could just take it and just throw it in a job or a service. It's gonna, I think long term is going to make it easier. There's the initial learning curve of like thinking about your problem in the context of task and actors. But once you get over that hump, your code is all Python. Every environment that runs Python can run Ray code. So I think you're not, it would be much harder if you had to like learn a new language, right? So I think it's. Yeah. And, and all of this running on Kubernetes means that you can also run your Jupyter Notebooks Perfect. on Kubernetes, right? Yeah. So. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Hi. Um, for the great talk, uh, for the development cycle, I'm guessing, you know, I'm a data scientist. I probably want to run this locally first on a one to two things. Yeah. Um, have you seen any issues going from running it locally to in a cluster, things to be aware of? And then secondly, are there concepts like caching or retrying an individual task? Uh, in the cluster. Yeah, so Ray has built-in mechanism for like failure recovery, like whatever they want to retry another logic. And the first question was like, what what we do about like going from local to cluster setup? Um, so if you do the ephemeral style of work where you define your worker, head node, and job at the same specification, the problems are a lot less because version mismatch, right? So Ray provides these images called the Ray, Ray, under Ray project slash Ray and Ray ML. These are the two base images they provide for just the core Ray core and Ray core plus CUDA and GPU drivers in it, right? So if you're building everything as the same thing, that means your code and the, like the cluster version are the same Ray. So problems are a lot less. When you try to create the static cluster, then you have to be a lot more careful about the Python you're writing versus the Python that, like this is as, strict as if you use Python 
and the cluster was running Python 3.10, it's not going to compile and run. Yeah. So there, and if it's minor version mismatch, like let's say Python 3.12.3 versus Python 3.12.7, it will give you a warning. So <laughs> they're a lot more strict about Python versions because, again, there is a lot of layers on top because you have Python, then Ray, then like CUDA libraries, then you have like Nickel and all the other like uh, driver specific things. So everything kind of has to have a very tight rope they have to walk. Yeah. And then if you are doing machine learning, typically uh, both tuning and uh, fine tuning and uh, and uh, training, you usually snapshot uh, your your, uh, your 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 model uh, yeah. very often, so you don't lose all the training work, right? So that that could help also with recovering from a failure. So like parameters of the decorator. Yeah. 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 Very much. Yeah. Thank you. Right. A question about like a reserve and retune. So I was wondering, like, because uh, we know like uh, GPUs are always getting failures. So like, uh, how how could retune and reserve handle that? Yeah. Again, so all the Ray libraries are just Python libraries. So any library that you use, like PyTorch, you could basically just wrap PyTorch in Ray decorators. So whatever mechanism TGI or PyTorch or like TensorFlow would give you, all of them just would work in the world of Ray. Ray is only do doing the work of orchestrating, right? So if you're using Ray Serve or Ray Tune, uh, they have very usual compatibility with like PyTorch or TensorFlow. But for the most part, the ask is not to move everything to Ray. The ask mostly is use Ray core and wrap your existing PyTorch, TensorFlow, TGI code into Ray constructs. Yes. That makes sense. So yeah, yeah. So in case of failure, is there some like Ray rollback functions? So Ray itself, I don't think has rollback, but the idea is if you're using PyTorch, you already had mechanism to like do checkpointing and rollback in that code. Ray does not actually invent that will. Ray just lets you call those functions from Ray orchestrator, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, then. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We're, we're getting the warning that we need to yeah. get off stage. Um, we can, we can, we, we can, can just take it. Step down. Yeah. We can just chat with you. Or if it's a quick question, I can just take it before they kick us out. Yeah, I'm just curious about for the Ray serve use case where you it's deploying, let's say, in a, you know, an inference workload. You mentioned uh, you have to bring your own load balancing, uh, you know, ingress. So that's where Kubernetes comes in, right? So Kubernetes yeah. does the load balancing yes. on your behalf. Just curious how, how, you know, what determinism there is on the pods that you can use the service discovery kind of primitives? Well, so the race, the race serve API will create a Kubernetes service for you. So that's how you would do, um, okay. uh, how we do okay. service discovery. And, and then the if you need to expose that to outside the cluster, then you will uh, create an ingress object that points to that service, basically. But do you have to discover it yourself, or is it deterministic, like based on some attributes? That, that's the it's name, deterministic. yeah. deterministic, that's the name. Name of the, the yeah. service itself. Okay. You can predict it upfront before it gets created. It's you part can of predict how it will look like. Sounds simple yeah. enough. Yeah, All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much.